Amen. church yeah this is awesome so we had 39 people get baptized and i couldn't believe how many young people were in the baptismal waters and so you start to hear yeah give it up it's awesome right the people say that the youngest generation's getting missed and i see this and i just go hallelujah we're seeing young people come to the lord i love it and i really hope that you're making jesus the center of your life especially you young people, that he's the most important thing. And I hope this sermon helps you see why. So we're in, in the middle of a series called The Seven Miracles of Jesus. And we're in Miracle 4 today. We're going to dig into this one. But first, who remembers the first one? What is that one? Water and wine. You all remember this, right? Somebody sent me a, some church humor. You want to check it out? Somebody thinks that Jesus stopped by Walgreens and made a little mistake here. Like, wait, is Jesus still showing up or what? Like, somebody's got a sense of humor. Love this. There's some miracle humor for you this morning. You don't get a lot of that every day. So now, <laughs> love that. <laughs> so we're going to study one of the more difficult to believe miracles today. And if you've been a part of a church for any amount of time, you know the story. All right, you've heard this one. And it's the only one recorded in all four Gospels. So every Gospel writer said this thing is important to learn from. We've got to learn from this one. But it's also one that the critics say is, well, it's hard to believe. And so as I read this, we're going to start, I'm going to read the whole story, and I want you to hear it. Listen very closely for what's happening, and you think of two questions. First question is, do you believe this miracle? Do you believe this is happening? And the second one is, if so, what difference does it make? Who cares? What's the deal? So do you believe it, and what difference does it make? So if you have your Bibles, grab them. hope you're reading along with John, and we're going to start chapter 6, verse 1. And here's what the scripture says. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, that's up in the north of Israel, big lake. And a great crowd of people followed him and because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. And so he's already performed a bunch of miracles. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said, Philip, hey, where should we buy bread for all these people to eat? And he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, well, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy even enough bread for them to have one bite, not even a whole meal. Another disciple, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Well, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. Nothing big about these. But he says, how far are these going to go? I mean, how far are they going to go? So Jesus said, have the people sit down. Watch this. There was plenty of grass in that place. It was a big grassy place. And they all sat down. About 5,000 men were there. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed those who were seated, and they had as much as they wanted. They ate their fill. He did the same with the fish. When they had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Nothing will be wasted. So they gathered them and filled the 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over and those who had eaten, by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is a prophet who is come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to, to, to make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. That is the miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. Now let me share the typical interpretation of this miracle. So Jesus is performing miracles all over. People are like, wow, this guy's incredible. So he's at like the height of his fame and people are just flocking to him. And they say the size of that crowd is 5,000 men, but that also doesn't include women and children. So some say this is between 8 and 16, maybe even 20,000. So if you look around the room to give you a size and scope, we might have five, 600 people here right now. Okay, imagine that times 10 minimum, that's who's following Jesus. This is a throng of people. This is a massive group of people. And they're hungry. And so he says to one of his disciples, which is Philip, he says, all right, how are we going to feed him? Where are we going to get money for this? And he says, it's impossible. There's no way. There's not even that much food around. 
And then another one, Andrew comes, he says, well, I got this kid here, and he's, look, he's got this, Jesus, five loaves, two small fish, but what's this going to do? He's super pessimistic. Now, the kid, love this kid. He's like, Jesus, he brings this to Jesus, goes, he's going to take care of it with this. The kid actually believes, but, you know, Andrew's like, ah, it's not going to help. And so Jesus says, okay, well, uh, why don't you everybody sit down? And everybody sits down. It's a grassy area. He puts them in groups, and they sit down, and he grabs a loaf, and he hands it out, and then he grabs another loaf, and, and then more just appear. I don't know where this comes from, but he finds all this bread, and he just keeps making it. He's making bread from bread, all right? And then he gets these little, these are tiny little fish, and I'll be honest, they're stinky chubs I'm going to eat later. <laughs> Smoked. Had to cover them, and y'all be like, come on, pastor, what are you doing to me here? But he got two small fish, and he just pulls a fish out, I mean, he just starts handing fish out, and it just keeps producing, so much so that you end up with 12 baskets. I got 12 coolers here, because, you know, today it would be coolers. They'd probably be Yetis. I don't know. Jesus rolls large. So this much is left over. So he's like, I, I, so I got this stuff here, feeds a throng 10 times in this room, and still this much is left over. Now, there's 12 here for a reason. We'll talk about that later. 12 baskets. He provides abundantly for everybody there. Not just a little bite, they're fill. And so he, that's the miracle, the traditional interpretation. Now let me ask you the questions again. Do you believe it? And if so, what difference does it make, okay? So, uh, because the reality is a lot of people don't believe this one. They don't believe God or Jesus can just take bread and make more bread. They don't believe he can make more fish. It's like it's an act of creation, an act of compassion. So what are some of the, th what are some of the theories that these critics talk about? So let's just talk a little bit about that. People struggle to really believe miracles these days, don't they? So here's a couple of the myths, the, the theories that people have as to how to explain a miracle. This is all miracles and this one in particular. So the first myth is a fraudulent, fraudulent myth theory. You ever hear this one? What they'll say is, you people, we do this naturally. We create myths around people we really like. We build them up, we tell tall tales, like Paul Bunyan and things like that. And you did that with Jesus, you know? You guys remember, ever see Braveheart? You got William Wallace. When William Wallace shows up, he's a larger than life guy. They say, you're not William Wallace, he's seven feet tall. And William Wallace says, oh yeah, and I shoot fireballs from my eyes and lightning bolts from my, well, you know what. <laughs> they all laugh, right? Because they mythologized William Wallace. When I was a kid, I grew up in the era of Bo Jackson. But you know Bo? Anybody remember Bo Jackson? A couple of you old, so people have been around a little bit. This Bo, look at that guy. He was a two-sport athlete, one of the first guys ever to play both baseball and played football. He was an all-pro in both. He was unbelievable. And as kids, we heard stories like, he can jump over two cars. Dude can run a four-flat, 4040. Nobody's run faster than Bo Jackson. He's like Superman. So we as kids are like, oh, no way. This bow is incredible. Like, we mythologized him like he was some sports god. And that's what they say we do with Jesus. Like, got 2,000 years to make up stories. And you guys just are telling stories to make him seem like he's bigger and cooler than he is. None of this is true. They, you can tell those stories, but they're not true. They're just myths, even though this was written right away and there's a whole lot of witnesses to it. They go, that's all you were doing. Fraudulent myth theory, okay? Another theory is... And this is kind of what I thought as a kid. It was the ethical miracle theory, ethical miracle theory. So what they thought, people thought is, okay, so some people brought bread, some people brought food, and others didn't. There were these foolish people who were just chasing after Jesus, and they don't even care. They don't even think about food. And then there's those people, you know, the prepared people in your life, they always bring stuff. They always got a water bottle and eight, eight snacks with them, right? You know, you know these people. I'm not one of them. But I know a lot of you. So he says, this is, this is what happened. So the, the people like the, foolish, like the foolish virgins who didn't bring enough stuff, well, the rich people, Jesus was so convincing of a teacher, so compelling, that he convinced the rich people to share with the poor. And so it was just really a redistribution of wealth. That's the miracle. And so Jesus was such a great teacher and such a magnetic personality that he, he convinced everybody just to share their food. And there was so much sharing of the food that went on that there was this much left over. Everybody ate, and it was this miracle of the redistribution of wealth. It was, it was the leveling of the playing field in society. You can only imagine where that goes politically, right? And so that's what some people say. Now, these two theories are pretty widely believed. Even in the church. Like, I feel like in, in the church, when I was young, I was kind of taught this. And I'm like, because I just couldn't, as a little kid, get my head around the fact that Jesus could make something out of nothing. 
Why is it so hard, do you think, for us to believe in miracles? Because underlying these is really a, a worldview, and it's a product of something called the Enlightenment and the naturalistic worldview that is taught in our public schools, fed to us as if it's truth, and we're made to feel foolish for believing in something like a God or a miracle could possibly happen. Now, I know you didn't come here probably wanting to hear about the naturalist worldview, but let me just unpack it a little. When you go to school in a public school, what are they going to tell you? How the world, how did everything happen, right? What's the name for that? Evolution, right? There's a big bang and the universe is all there is. And what naturalism believes is that the universe is a closed system. So nothing from outside the universe can get into it like a god. So the laws of nature are all that there is. There's nothing else. It's just the way it is. And so uh, there is no god. And so therefore, if miracles, they don't line up with science, do they? You can't measure them with your senses. And so therefore, they are just considered irrational. And they're impossible. And therefore, you could cast them off. Well, how do we respond to that as Christians? How do you answer somebody who says, you know, you're in school and they go, how do you, what do you, what do you want me to say? Let me just share two ways, two things that we gotta, gotta name. First, is you just have to name as Christians. We have to name that the Bible and Christians come from a totally different worldview that doesn't jive with a naturalist worldview. They are at odds and we have to name that. And so the Bible, when you read it, if you read this book, and it's good, do it. What, what's the first line of the Bible? Anybody remember? In the beginning, God created what? Heavens and the earth. So right out of the gate, the Bible says the universe is not a closed system at all. Everything you see is the creation of God. You're the creation of God. And what do you call creation? Good. He called you very good, right? So he created the universe. It's not a closed system. And so it makes sense then that we, it's reasonable to believe, I think, that if the supernatural acted supernaturally in creation, why couldn't a miracle happen? Like, why, why couldn't we believe that the supernatural could, in, you know, come into the world again, right? Like, that's totally, as, in a biblical perspective, that's, and most people throughout history go, I have no problem believing miracles, because they believe that. That's not hard to believe. And so there's a radically different worldview that underlines the Christian faith. And the miracles make sense, but not to our five senses. So people call miracles senseless, because you can't measure them with your five senses, but it puts in the category of the supernatural, which is God. So, different worldview, but if that's not, let me just, another way we can defend the miracles is while miracles are outside the realm of scientific investigation, right? The scientific method doesn't work with them. They're not outside the realm of historical investigation, are they? Now let's assume for a minute the Bible's a credible document, a credible historical document. You might go, eh, I don't know. Google it. It's worth a Google. Certain things are worth a Google. Just Google it and go, oh, wow, well, there's some evidence of this. Archaeology. History will show you the Bible's pretty legit. And even if you want to say, well, even if it's a little legit, the Bible, if you read it, is teeming with miracles and wonders and all kinds of things that are assumed true. I mean, you go back to the beginning. Creation's a miracle. I mean, boom, the world exists. God speaks it in seven days into existence. And then you have miracles with Moses and, and, and Elijah, Elisha, Peter, Paul, and Jesus. And people see them, and they talk about it. Trust me, they were talking. And somebody wrote that stuff down. History in the Bible attests to miracles. Now, we're studying the 5,000, right? The feeding of the 5,000. At least 5,000 people saw that one because they ate the bread. People literally ate the bread and saw this happen, okay? Probably more like 15,000. And they talked. And tens of thousands of others saw the miracles of Jesus. They just did, okay? That happened. People attest to it. And the way we probably know that's true is even the enemies of Jesus attest to it. They saw it too, and they talked about it, and they wrote it down. They were angry at him. We're going to study a miracle in a couple weeks where he heals a blind man and the Pharisees can't even believe it. They're furious with Jesus, but they can't deny it happened. And so the Bible attests to this. It gives credibility to the miracles, but if that's not enough, let me share some extra biblical evidence. Other sources do too. There's a Roman historian named Josephus who attests to who Jesus is, and, and he calls Jesus specifically a doer of startling deeds. He's talking about the miracles. You should read what else he has to say about Jesus. It's pretty incredible. And then there's the Babylonian Talmud. It says, Jesus was executed because he practiced magic and led the Israelites astray. He's talking about the miracles. He's saying this really happened. And it provides, yeah, I've given you the references. You can look this stuff up. Now, this doesn't prove he, he did the miracles, but it's enough for you to go, huh, there's got to be something to this. The Bible and extra, and all these places are talking about him being a miracle worker. So let me ask you the question again. What do you believe? Do you believe this is true? Do you need more evidence? What do you need to hear to believe that miracles are real? And now, if you do believe, what difference does it make? 
Okay, so what? So they exist. What difference does it make if miracles exist? Let me talk about that for a minute. And let's think about these, these biblical versus a naturalist worldview. You have these two clashing. Let me borrow from the work of R.C. Sproul. Here's what he says about why it matters. He says, listen to this. If you're a naturalist, nothing makes any difference. Do you ever think of that? If you're a naturalist, nothing matters. I mean, the universe, if that's all that exists, everything is meaningless. I mean, there's no God. Nature's all that exists. Everything's totally random. And the universe began randomly and is meaningless, and it's tumbling towards a meaningless ending where it's just going to one day come to an end, and that will be meaningless. Therefore, everything in between of it is meaningless, including you. You're meaningless in what you think and feel, and in the end, it doesn't matter because you're just going to cease to exist. And there is nowhere to go. There is nobody who cares about you. You see, the thing about the nature is not hostile. Nature's not hostile. It's worse. It's indifferent. It does not care about you. There's nothing if you believe this. If you're a naturalist, it's just meaninglessness, survival of the fittest, and then it all comes crashing down in a blaze of meaninglessness. And if you want to subscribe to that bleakest, least imaginative worldview, go for it. And you could feel enlightened, but you're not, because that is miserable. I mean, come on. What if there's a difference? What if there's a, what if there's a different way? What if we're not looking at this right? Now, there's a theologian, this German named Jürgen Moltmann, and he says, what if you got it wrong? What if we're actually flying upside down here in this one? I just love what he says. He says, he says what if we have it backwards? What if the miracles are not an interruption to the natural order, but a restoration of the natural order? See, we assume sickness and death are natural. What if they're the interruption? You ever think, wait, wait a minute here. Listen to this guy's quote. And if you've tuned me out, listen to this for a moment, okay? This is what he writes. He says, when Jesus expels demons and heals the sick, he's driving out of creation the powers of destruction, and he's healing and restoring created beings who are hurt and sick. It's the lordship of God to which the healings witness restores creation to health. Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. They're not. They're the only truly natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. What if the miracles of the kingdom of God breaking through into our world, bringing healing and restoration, what if it's the only natural thing you've ever seen? I have two friends going through a horrible divorce. Two separate situations. This last week I'm talking to my wife about one of these. The spouse is being horrible. It's so sad. You see the kids suffering. The family tore apart. And I just, in my head and heart, I'm going, why? It's not right. This is not fair. It's not okay. You ever feel like that? Like with a sickness or a situation in life and you just say out loud, like, it's not right. It's not okay. My uncle sits down on a couch two months ago, has a massive heart attack and dies. Never says goodbye to anybody. He's 62 years old. I go, what? I love him. I want to talk to him again. He's just gone? Yeah, it's not right, God. It's not okay. That's in my, I'm going like, this doesn't make sense. You ever feel that way? Well, if so, you're right. You know, you're right. It isn't okay, and it shouldn't be this way, and it's not what God intended, is it? Because when he created the world, and that's what we want to believe, what did he create? He said it was all what again? Good. And you are very good. And in the beginning, was there any sickness or death? No. The natural state of creation is one without any of that. And we live in a world so torn up, so broken, so hurting, that we just assume that's natural. It's death is natural. It's the, they say he just went naturally. No. No. That is not what God intended. When he created the world, he said everything was good. And so what if... When Christ heals a sick person or raises the dead, he's momentarily restoring creation to its natural condition. What if he's offering us a glimpse of what is to come? Now, whether you want to believe that's true or not, isn't that at least a better worldview? I mean, come on. Like, that's just, it takes so much more whimsy and imagination. It's at least worth a look. I want you to wrestle with that and go, I'd rather dare to believe that than think I've got to figure it figured out with naturalism. Because what the miracles are is God breaking through into our world to give us a glimpse of what is to come. It's a 
picture of heaven in the restoration that's gonna come when Jesus Christ comes back. So the feeding of the 5,000, now this miracle is meant to be a snapshot of heaven, okay? A momentary snapshot of heaven. Think of it this way, a hungry crowd comes to Jesus. They're in the presence of the Lord and and they're hungry and they're needy and, and Jesus says, sit down and I will give you rest. And he puts us in pockets and community and and we all spend time at the feet of the Lord. And then he hands out food. Not just a bite, but he says, hey, whatever you want, eat it. And he feeds you abundantly. He fills us with everything that we need. And then there's so much that the Lord gives us that there's an abundance left over. Nobody's left hungry. Everybody's full. Everybody's satisfied. It's a picture of what it's going to be like in the presence of our Father in heaven. Every need met, no sickness. Everybody is there together. There's no loneliness and you're in the presence of God, but it was temporary. It was just a momentary glimpse. See, Jesus knew everybody would be hungry again. And what he was doing is he was creating a hunger in that crowd, a hunger in us through this miracle for more. You should want more. And he's saying, I want you to believe for a minute I've got more to offer you. This this miracle... Let me tell you why this matters so much. He's doing something here. This miracle sets up a shocking revelation and an outrageous invitation. This miracle isn't meant to stand alone, okay? Everything in the Bible, every, every one of these miracles either is set up or set something up for you to learn, okay? And so let me talk about the shocking revelation for a moment here, okay? Jesus is about to explain something to people. And so there are, in the Bible, in, in John, there's seven I am statements, all right, seven. There's seven miracles, seven I am statements. He doesn't get to the I am statements until four miracles, so people have a sense that he's serious when he says what he's saying. Now, the I am statements are his declaration. They're a revelation of Jesus' divinity. It's him saying, I'm God, right? Now, this goes back to Moses in the burning bush. Remember that story? So Moses out, he's just tending sheep, and a bush is burning, and he's like, oh, stop, and he looks at it. And he goes to the bush, and the bush talks to him. And it, it's God. And he's like, in the, in the bush, there's burning. He says, Moses, go free my people. Let my people go. And he's like, uh, well, who are you? Tell me your name. What does God, what does God say? I am. I am who I am, right? He says, I am. That's my name. Every Jewish kid, everybody listening to Jesus knows that story. So when Jesus says, I am, nobody says that kind of stuff. He's declaring that I am the Lord. And so the miracle of 5,000 sets up the first I am statement. Now, let me tell you the story. The people were so in awe of God that they wanted to make him king, force him to be king, because they would never be without food. But Jesus wants to be a different kind of king for the people. And so the story goes that when Jesus gets done feeding the 5,000, they want to force him into this. He goes and he hides on him. And then at nighttime, he comes out of the mountain, meets the disciples in the middle of the lake. He walks on water. I don't know if you heard that story. That's crazy. We'll do it next week. Come on back. Wild stuff. I mean, it's hard to believe, right? And they go to the other side, and the people come and confront Jesus and go, hey, we want you to be our king. All right? And, and Jesus says, hey, you know what? He says, you only want me because I can feed you, don't you? And they're like, mm, yeah. And he goes, why, why, we, why would you want something so limiting? Why just food? I don't search that which can perish, he says. Hope for what can give eternal life. And they say, okay, yeah, we'll take, he says, they say, always feed us that food. <laughs> They're smart, always. He goes, okay, well, now here's the shocking. Listen to this revelation. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. Let me translate this into a Jewish audience. This is what they would have heard. Jesus, God, Jesus just said, I'm God in the flesh and I want to satisfy your deepest longings forever. I am the bread of life. The shocking revelation, he's saying, I am God and I'm offering myself to you. You want bread? I want to give you the kingdom of God. You you want a king? I want to give you a savior. I want to give you the king of kings. Why are you asking me here for bread when I'm offering myself to you? You, Why do you long so little? You know what he's doing here? He's exposing the weakness of their desire. He's exposing the same thing in you. He's saying, why do you come to me? I, the, the Lord has entered the world. I'm standing in front of you. Why do you, why do you want so little? What he's saying is you come to me only when you need me and then I, you go off and you live your life without me and I'm offering so much more to you. I want you to wrestle with this. Maybe God wants more for you and your life than you do. 
That's what's, that's what's being exposed here, you know. Let me read a quote to you by C.S. Lewis. I just love this. Gets at this better than I could ever say. He says, you know, it would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. And we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea. We are far too easily pleased. <sighs> Isn't he right? Like we're so easily pleased, so easily satisfied. We settle for so little. God's offering himself to you. And what we say is, can I just have a little for today so I can get back in my slum and make mud pies? I mean, it's, it's like, what are, you, what are we doing? We only come to him when we're hungry and empty and we say, oh, you know, I just need a little food for today and, and then I'm going to get on with my life. I just need a little bit of your blood, Jesus, so I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die and then I'm going to go live my life over here. We don't even live for him in this life. And when he says, I am the bread of life, he's saying, I want to give you the... I want you to have a holiday by the sea. I want you to experience the fullness of life and you want to go back to your slum. See, the truth is God wants more for you in your life than you want for you. And you want to receive what he has for you? You want the fullness of what God offers you? You have to accept the outrageous invitation. Okay? Now, the the feeding of the 5,000 sets up the shocking revelation, which is I am the bread of life, which sets up the outrageous invitation. And I call it outrageous because it is. You'll hear it and you'll go, whoa. Now, Jesus is about to speak to us in hyperbole. Hyperbole is a shocking statement not meant to be taken literally, but it means something very deep. And so here it is. Listen to this. This is the uh, invitation. He says in verses 53 and 54, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. You go, wait, what? what did you say? Yeah, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Right? That's the shocking revelation. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. You want the holiday by the sea? You want everything I have to offer you? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Now you can imagine the people go, whoa, hold on a minute. What did you just say out loud? Right, this crowd wants to force them to be king. You know what they did now? They go, what, do you want us to be cannibals? Now, how do we do that, Jesus? Like, I mean, he's really confronting the people. Are, are, you really want me? This is what I'm saying. And most of them turn their back and walk away. They're done. The disciples go, we're still with you. Where else are we going to go? But the rest, pack it out and go because this is too hard of a teaching. What does he mean by this? What's he talking about? He's not talking physically. He's talking spiritually. And when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, what he's really saying is he's talking about what we let at the core of our being, what we let at the deepest, closest part of our hearts, So think about eating and what happens when you eat. If you eat something, it goes into the center of your body and is distributed everywhere through it. If you eat something healthy, it nourishes you. If you put in something toxic, it contaminates you and it affects everything in your life. What he's saying is, I want to be the center of your life. I want to be the most important thing in your life. I want you to wake up and think about me. Go to bed thinking about me. I want you to hide my word in your heart. I want you to believe everything that I say. I want you to live for me. Do what I say. Pray to me every day. And most importantly, I want my Holy Spirit to rest inside of you. I'm going to place my spirit in you. It will permeate every cell of your body. That's the invitation. That's what it means to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Make me the most important thing in your life. Those of you who came out of the waters of baptism today, that is what I want for you. That's what that means. He's saying, let me be the center. Get the other stuff out. All idolatry, all other things out. I want to be the center of your life and very few people seem to take them up on that because in that is the fullness of life. And that's his invitation to us. What is that thing for you? Do you know him like that? Be his disciple. That's the first thing. Now, there's another meaning that they wouldn't have seen about eat my flesh, drink my blood. There's one other meaning that, that, that nobody knew even for another year. And so if you know the story, this is right around Passover, right? That's what this text says. Well, the next Passover, a year later, Jesus, he's led into Jerusalem and he knows what's going to happen, right? With the triumphal entry, we just celebrated Easter. And he gathers his disciples to him and he says, look guys, we're going to have one last meal together. I want to celebrate Passover with you because I'm going to die. And they're like, wait, what? And so he sits him down and 
he grabs a loaf of bread. And if you don't know the Passover story, the, the reason the Jews celebrate Passover is it's the sparing of the firstborn of the 12th plague of Egypt. Let me give you a little history on this. So back to Moses, there were 12 plagues. The final one was the worst, and it was the firstborn of everybody in Egypt would die unless God provided a provision. If you sacrifice, and you're, you're one of his people, a spotless lamb, and you take the blood of that lamb and you put it over your door frame, the angel of death, when it comes, will pass over that house and spare the child. Whoever Jew did that, and all the Jewish firstborn children survived. And so every time they celebrate Passover, it's a celebration of God's provision against death. And so Jesus comes and he grabs a piece of bread and he says, look, grab this. And he takes it and he gives it to everybody. He says, take it, this is my body. It will be broken for you. And then he grabs a cup of wine and they all drank and they gave thanks. He said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And the disciples were like, wait, what's going on here? Jesus changing the, the meaning of the Passover. He's saying, wait, no, I'm the lamb, you see. It's my blood that's going to be spilled. And when that blood is spilled, it's going to cover the doorframe of your heart so that sin may be forgiven and death can pass over you so you can be in eternal life. Three days later, he's nailed to a cross. Three days later, he rises from the dead. And they go, oh, I get it. You're the lamb. You're the Passover lamb. And so in the church, we, we create the Last Supper. We celebrate something called communion, where we symbolically eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus. So that crazy, outrageous idea becomes something that symbolically we do to remember what he did. And so like a hungry crowd, we come to Jesus in need of forgiveness and love and care. There's sins that we did this last week that we need to confess to him to have forgiven. And he says, come to me. Here we are gathered. And he's like, I want to I I meet your needs. The, the feeding of the 5,000 is a foreshadowing of what we're about to do. Because here we are, a hungry, needy crowd. And God says, I have so much more. If you have so much grace and love, there's this left over. See, the 12 coolers represent the 12 tribes of Israel, which represents the promise that one day he would send a Savior. And he's saying to you, the Savior is here. There's 12. There's abundance. I have abundance for you today. And so when we celebrate communion. We join literally today on Sunday as we celebrate hundreds of millions of other Christians across the world who will come to the supper of the Lamb and we're going to celebrate communion in, in brothers and sisters throughout the world. And so today we're going to join them. So why don't you grab that little cup for a minute. And this is how we're going to end today. <clears throat> Our communion table is open to anybody who calls Jesus Lord and wants to eat his flesh and drink his blood and understands what that means. If you're at home watching online, pause it if you want. Go grab the elements and join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so what I want to ask you to do is grab that, uh, that little bread and hold it out for a minute. <laughs> and I want you to remember, as you hold this, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, our Savior. And I want you to believe that God has entered into our world. It's not a universe. The universe is not a closed system. God has sent his son who came and translated himself into the human condition. He allowed his body to be nailed to a cross and broken for you because he loves you. I want you to grab this piece of bread, break it. His body is broken for you because he loves you. And I want you to eat this together with me and receive his love. Let's eat together. Mm. Lord, you are good. And grab this cup. Hold this thing for a moment. And we're going to drink his blood, and it's just wild that this makes sense, right? And what this blood represents, right, is the, it's the blood over the door that allows death to pass over us, our sins to be forgiven. It's the guarantee of eternal life. And I want you to dare to believe today that no matter what sin you've ever committed or will commit or have brought in here today, that the blood of Jesus Christ covers the sin. God looks at you, he goes, you're my perfect, spotless, white, you're, uh, you're good with me, your sin is forgiven. As we drink this, remember that we are clean and that this is the guarantee of eternal life with Jesus Christ. Let's drink the blood and receive eternal life and forgiveness. Mm. Lord, what did we do to deserve a savior like you? I'm so grateful, Lord, that you provided your son. This miracle foreshadowing made it all fit together so it works for our good. Lord, help us to not be half-hearted creatures who keep fooling about with the silly things of our life and give our lives and hearts to you. Let us be a church, Lord, that, that 
feasts on you, Lord. So name in us where we're, where we're lacking, where our desire is too weak, and help us, Lord, to truly pursue you and get all that you want to offer us to really put you at the center of our life. Thank you for your son and the provision that we just had in communion of the forgiveness of sin and the brokenness of your body, Lord. We thank you for your love, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before you go, I want you to think about three questions this week. I want us to wrestle with where, where we might be far too easily pleased. Because of all these things, that's what's stuck in my heart. So I want you to wrestle with, where am I not trusting God to provide? Where might you not be trusting Him? Where, where might you not be trusting Him to satisfy your desire? What do you turn to instead of Him? And where are you not letting God lead you into something better? Ben talked about, are you stuck? Do you want to get healed? He's saying today, again, will, I, will you let me lead you to something better? Wrestle with that as you go into this week. And just remember how much God loves you and how much he's provided.